Welcome to Conquest Creations. With me, I've got two of the most experienced tournament players I know, and we're going to break down the army lists for the Conquest Champions Battle Report League. The Conquest Champions Battle Report League is an eight-player, 500-point elimination tournament. You're going to be able to watch every single game here on Conquest Creations, and it's all made possible by the Conquest Creation web store. We sell awesome high-quality miniatures, and by purchasing them, you're allowing us to develop more Battle Report Leagues just like this one. Hello and welcome. I am Jacob Lucas. With me, I've got Sean and Josh. Sean, do you want to introduce yourself? G'day, I'm Sean. Uh, I've been playing the hobby for a few years now. Uh, recently, just started doing pretty well in tournaments. So uh, got myself a few firsts and seconds. So uh, hopefully I can say something smart. I think you're definitely uh, selling yourself a bit short there. A couple first places and second places in tournaments is no mean feat. I'd definitely say you're an experienced player. So that's right, selling so. yourself short when you're like six foot four isn't really a, a great <laughs> comment for you too, mate. So Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Josh, that goes into your turn. <laughs> yeah, okay, guys. I'm uh, Josh McCollman on Josh Lance on Facebook. Um, I'm... Uh, I've been in the hobby scene for Lord of the Rings for nine on 10 years now. Um, I've won Arcanicon back to back, uh, back when that was one of the major tournaments here in Melbourne. Uh, I've uh, won uh, Conquest uh, at the, the Vic tournament a few times, Clash of the Titans. Uh, I've gone over to New Zealand to represent Australia. I've been to the UK to represent Australia and uh, I've one of the few tournament players who's actually been to nearly every state in Australia to play the game. So uh, a little bit of experience. Uh, and I also taught Sean how to play. So I'll take that into, uh, <laughs> into to consideration as well. Uh, I got to introduce myself next. I really shouldn't have gone after Josh. Um, <laughs> I've got uh, four second places at this point. Uh, so we're hoping to, hoping to bump that up and played. Oh, don't even know how many tournaments, but uh, I play this game a lot enough to uh, try to make a business and YouTube channel solely based around it. All right, let's break down the first list. Up first, we've got Brody the Underdog. Brody is taking a Rivendell list, starting out with Glorfindel, the Lord of the West, with Asfloth and the Armor of Gondolin. He's got five High Elf Warriors with Spear and Shields, four High Elf Warriors with no equipment, and then a high elf captain on horse with elf bow, a lance and shield. That's the full kit. And then four Rivendell knights with shields and one Rivendell knight with a banner and a shield. So Josh, you've had a heap of tournament success with your Rivendell. So I'm going to give you the first shot at breaking down this list. I think it's a really nice, simple army to start with for those people starting out with Rivendell. It covers a lot of your bases. Like it's got the fast moving Rivendell knights in there. Uh, it's certainly got a lot of defense six uh, with the uh, higher force of the spear and shield there uh, and the Rivendell Knights. Um, I question being a little bit more experienced with Rivendell and, and uh, knowing a little bit more about this army, the benefit of having a bow on that captain, his defense seven uh, with all of that equipment, being able to get into combat is where he's going to be most useful and versatile. Um, that, those five points could have been used to give those four high elf warriors on foot uh, a shield or something just to keep them alive. The great thing, and people often forget about it with an elven blade, is that you can choose to go two-handed even if you have a shield. Uh, and giving those guys a shield would just give this army a little bit more survivability. Elves are a great unit, uh, arguably the best heavy infantry in the game considering their fight, their courage but you do pay a premium for that in points. And if you're paying a premium already for a really good fight warrior, you should be giving it a shield. And I just think that the, the, the only downside to this list as a Rivendell player that I can see is that is taking a bow on that captain. Yeah, I think, I mean, I totally agree with you. Shields on everything with Rivendell. When you got fight five and you can shield, you're becoming really, really durable. And especially because it gives you the plus one defense as well. Being a player that doesn't really use Cav all that often, I question whether it's worth having the Rivendell Knights or whether you drop the footman and just go all out Rivendell Knights, but I'm not a Rivendell player. Josh is the one who tormented Victoria for however many years with Rivendell Knights. Uh, this is his domain. 
the reason you just hate the Rindell Knights in that list is simply so you have something that can kill high defence models um, and just the ability to knock things down. Elf Strength 3 is probably the one detriment to the entire army. Obviously, they've got access to Elven Blades that you can go one-handed or two-handed with. Um, you just really need something that can dish the damage out because the amount of times that you'll fight against dwarves or another army that's defence seven or higher, uh, even defence six really is going to is going to push you. So you might win the combat, but not being able to do do any damage outside of your heroes is going to really hurt your army moving forward. All right, well let's jump into our next player. We've got William the Isengard guy. He's playing the Assault on Helm's Deep Legendary Legion. So it's the Legendary Legion from War in Rohan. Uh, he's got an Urukai Captain with eight Urukai Warriors with shields. Sorry, that Urukai Captain has a shield as well. Eight Urukai Warriors with shield, eight Urukai Warriors with pike, one Urukai Warrior with a pike and banner. Then he's taken an Urukai Shaman, two Urukai Berserkers, five Urukai Warriors with shield, five Urukai Warriors with pike, and finally got Assault Ballista. So... This is the Legendary Legion, where his captain is getting plus one attack and wound. And that Assault Ballista is getting rerolled fail misses and scatter rolls. I'm afraid of this list. Yeah, I 500 points for the Isengard Ballista. Or odd, I say odds are, but no, there's a very high chance that any army coming towards him is going to lose a lot of models beforehand, especially if they don't spread out which what you need to do against them. But look, I think <laughs> he's there to just ruin someone's day, really, isn't he, with that legendary legion? Yeah, absolutely. And Will, he did recently come second place at a tournament in Adelaide using uh, an army similar to this. I don't know if it was the same composition or not, but he's clearly experienced with this Assault on Helm's Deep legendary legion. I, I, I must be having a brain moment because I thought that Urukai Shamans were a minor hero and could only have a warband of six. You are but, totally correct, but one of the special rules for the Legendary Legion is their warband sizes are increased by six. Oh, brilliant. Oh, cool. Okay, shit. that okay. answers that question. I was yeah. sitting here looking at that going, wait, hang on, am I missing something? I really, I must be missing something. But um, <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot more sense. That's uh, that's really good. Um, I've always played Urukai a little bit different to people. I actually don't like Pikes. Oh, oh, that's a controversial statement. It is a very controversial statement. Uh, it has caught me out several times. Uh, Kylie is not a big fan of my way of thinking. Um, I just find that people are too keen to put pikes and to spend time getting their models of three, fighting one other model with your or, or a kite at the front with the shield and sword and board and... What I've found is that more often than not, actually having the two Urukai in there gives you more of an option because you can shield for the four. So I think I took to uh, Masters, like one of the first times I'd ever ran a 52 model Urukai army where 36 of them were just Urukai warriors with shields. Uh, and it was actually traumatic for people to play against because they're like, there's no defense five for my strength three guys to kill. What am I meant to do? Yeah. Uh, that being said, the sheer amount of numbers in this list is actually amazing. Like they're all strength four. Uh, you've got 30 plus miniatures here that uh, 30 plus. Yeah. I've messed that wrong too bad. Have I? Uh, um, I think I'm mathing good. I'm, I'm good. Just about I'm good. Yep. Cool. Yep. Uh, so that's pretty solid. And then you've got the Urukai Ballista as well. The only thing you can question is like, could you have put one or two crossbows in there? Um, to be honest, I think with this list and a build around that ballista, you really need to put the pressure on your enemy straight away. So I like the fact the entire army is designed to be moving forward. There's not really going to be something that goes, do I sit back for a turn or not? So from my point of view, I really like the list because it's, it's one of those armies that kind of pushes that assault mentality that the list really needs to have. Yeah, it's interesting what you said. On Helm's Deep, so. mm. It's interesting what you said about how you run Isengard because I think I'm polar opposite to you. I played a 750 <laughs> list. I probably played oh, 35 games with it, and it doesn't have pikes and bombs. <laughs> so it's I go pikes, berserkers, and crossbows. And there's no space for shieldmen in there. I actually quite like the idea of not taking too many pikes because yeah, it, it stops you from potentially trapping yourself wanting to go three deep with your pike wall 
as opposed to the Eastlings who have their phalanx rule, where that um, allows you yeah. to do that. Additionally to that, my thing was just how annoying breaking a pike model in a figure case oh, was and having yeah. to deal with that was yeah. part of the mentality <laughs> too. But um, I, yeah, like, ironically, I had no pikes in that list. Um, oh, fair. It's not to say that they don't work. Sometimes having those extra attacks and keeping your slightly less defended models at the back protected is great but you'll find that you're going to lose a lot more of those shields quick just simply because they are at the front of the excuse me front of the army so mm. yeah and i want to talk about the urukai shaman in this list overall i think of all the shamans the urukai shaman is the one that i'm least likely to take now there's a few reasons for that mainly i'm taking fury to deal with terror and Isengard already has two great ways of dealing with terror. They've got Berserkers, who are Courage 7, so don't care about it. And you've got Pikes, which just means that if you can charge one model in, then your Pikes can support it, and you can still get a bunch of extra attacks. So I actually disagree with taking a Shaman, particularly in this list. What do you guys think about that Shaman? Look, after going up against Melbeth quite a lot recently, anything that's not got a 5 plus Fury save is dead for me. I don't want to see it. <laughs> Yeah, it's only, yeah, six up for the Urukai Shaman if you mm. channel it. Yeah. But no, I, it's it's an interesting choice for sure. Could he have gone with another captain? I probably would have gone that way, but you might be dropping a few troops there. But he's got I the numbers think, to do so. I think you need it. And I'm going to simply base that decision on how prevalent magic is in the game today, how, how much more common special rules like Terra are. As great as being um, Courage 3 with Urukai pretty much across the board, having that Shaman there is going to be the difference between one or two models being able to charge uh, each and every turn potentially against a terrifying creature. And even if you were to go hammer to the wall and instead of using it for Fury to transfix, potentially means that your Strength 5 Captain can get into combat and do a fair bit of damage if he's got that Pike support against another hero that maybe gets caught out unluckily against that Transfix as well. Um, and interestingly, I would actually be using those Berserkers more to hold objectives away from my main battle line, particularly where I don't have a Captain or Shaman. And if the army does break, we know the Urukai get that amazing rule where they don't break until they reach 33%. Um, but the just being able to have those two berserkers in the list to basically hold objectives and intimidate as well uh, is going to be something really helpful. And again, having the shaman to keep the army around to help pass terror checks to charge, um, and even the odd enemy sentinel or spectre which might target a model and try to throw a spanner in the works by moving you, it gives you an option or a way out of passing those. Yeah, and we do know how prevalent Sentinels and Spectres are in our meta. You see them quite often, so it is worth really having a plan to deal with them. Yeah, no, that's that's a fair statement. Most and definitely. just talking about this list as a whole, uh, this applies to all Assault on Helm's Deep Armies, but they've got no strike. So that's where that Ballista really needs to come in and try to take down those big heroes because they don't have any other tools to do it. Yeah, but yeah, I also question the the higher fight models that you're going to see um, at such a points limit. At 500 points, fight five, fight six is probably the most you're going to see. You're not going to be seeing too many heroes that are the fight six, three attacks, three might, three will, three fate, because it is going to detract a lot from your model count. Uh, we just saw it in the last list with uh, Rivendell, like taking... Uh, uh Glorfindel is such a huge amount of points that you got to sink oh, 170 points from memory uh into a model to 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 take at 500 points does detract a lot from uh the model count that you're going to get and also potentially it takes away from how much how many heroes or how you can support the army as a whole yeah i i definitely agree with that i think that the ballista is still a great choice even if you don't have those big hero targets, it's still going to be able to put out so much damage. Um, and a big thing that people don't realize is if it hits the combat that anyone's in or a model is hit and then flung into that combat, knocks everyone prone. So it's really good at just nerfing heroes by just knocking them prone and saying, Glorfindel, you can't kill anyone this turn because you've been knocked prone. Yeah. Even the psychological yeah. factor of the Ballista, though, that's, that's, big, that's a big part of the game I've recently learned is is the psychological factor of certain models and siege weapons are perfect for it. 
you know, oh, it's, it's that threat down. potential, it's, holding flanks down, whatnot. Yeah. It, yeah. It's ground denial. Like no one is going to run through open, open ground towards a siege weapon. No. Like <laughs> a, a, you look at the statistical chance and odds, it's the exact same as if you were behind cover. But the fact of the matter is that people will look at that and go, I've got to run eight or nine inches through an open area <laughs> to get to that thing. I'm going to lose models, but there's ways around it. That being said, though, if this thing is going to be amazing against the monsters that you do see at this points limit. Like if somebody was to take like a cave drake or a, a just a troll in general, something like that is going to be the big difference between having control of the battlefield against those targets as well. Yeah, well, I think we've broken down that list. How about we jump into the next one? Yep. All right. So... Uh, this army is actually my own army. I'm Jacob, the Conquest creator. And uh, talking about big heroes, I've got one. So I'm playing a Last Alliance-themed army. I've got a Green Alliance with Rivendell and Numenor. So I've gone with Gilglad, the High King of the Elves, on horse with a shield. So he's fully kitted up. I've got seven Kingsguard with spear and shield. Now those are Elven Warriors that get a one-point upgrade from Gilglad that takes them to fight six. Uh, I've also got three high up warriors with bows and then a captain of Numenor with shield and heavy armor, four warriors of Numenor with shield, four with bow, three with spear and shield, and then just one with only a banner. So what do you guys think? 24 models in that list with Gilgalad at 500. That's not bad at all. You've got, yeah, what is it? 23 models supporting Gilgalad when you eventually get yourself into combat. I'm genuinely big fan i do just like any last alliance list it's always a lot of fun to see on the table don't see them too often but big fan high defense captain uh, a shit version of the dale captain is what i call the numenorian captains um but yeah they're great they're absolutely great so it's it's a solid list a nice number of bows in there i love bows that's my bread and butter so that love it I look at this list and go, that's something that I would probably run. It's a really nice little um, list that's themed around a, a, a key battle in Middle Earth. Um, the Captain of Numenor brings in a heroic march, which is an absolute amazing bonus to have in any elf army, uh, particularly amongst all those Numenoros. But again, I look at this and go, this is very much a... a it is a glass weapon or whatever the term is. It is something that can, has a huge amount of damage potential with all of those uh, strength for Numenorians, which is great. Uh, but that being said, there you, part of me also sits here with a little bit of nervousness going, it's a one fate hero and another one fate <laughs> hero. The survivability is there because it's high defense, but at least with Glorfindel, you've got anti-magic in him with his uh, armor of Gondolin and his own innate special rules. But this, uh, like Gilgalad, personal experience, I've used him a heap, is an amazing, brutal character who can dish out potentially more damage than anybody else in the game for uh, a hero of his stature and size in terms of model miniature base. Uh, but he is very, very brittle. And if he gets caught out, he can die very, very quickly. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to see how this list goes against the other armies on the day. Um, with that one fate, you certainly wouldn't want to get hit by a ballista twice, Jacob. That's all yeah. I'm going to say. I was I gotta say that exactly going to say that you're not going to want to go up against that. <laughs> so my thinking behind this list is I just want to stop my enemy from doing from damaging me in any way so i've got fight six spears that are supporting my strength for troops so i've got high fight and strength so i'm not planning on losing any fights and i'm planning on killing things when i win and at 500 points i'm hoping no one's brought anything that's going to stop gilgalad because he as you said josh just has insane damage output and if he can go in and, you know, charge two models, call a heroic combat, charge two more and kill four models and do that two or three turns and then get a hero at some point, if he can kill a hero, he gets a point of might back for the blood and glory special rule. He should be able to put out a lot of work. I think he is a bit of a gambit though, because if someone brings something that can stop him, they're going to stop my whole army. Yeah, I... 
The, the only other critiques, Jacob, I can give about this army is you've got Numenor in there that aren't taking full advantage of their special rule, the Blood of Numenor. They yes. don't have they don't have uh, uh, Elendil or uh, Sealdor in there to kind of gather around and take advantage of their resistant to magic special rule. Um, the other idea about having your Numenorians at the front with your elves behind. Uh, I'd almost be having your elves at the front. I know they've got spears and everything like that, but a, a defense five, defense five, that odd number, particularly in infantry and infantry with shields, is always a very, very tricky one. Uh, I know I've used it in Dale quite successfully with defense five, but then again, I've had another 12 miniatures on top of what you've got yeah. here in this list at defense yeah. five. So I can take a few losses. I'm just concerned, um, particularly being that lower defense. And once you do get to combat, if you do lose, you, you, your frontline infantry are dying on fives to a basic uh, any orc or, or human three, yeah. men model in the game, uh, as opposed to a defense six model, which is going to survive a little bit longer. Uh, no, I, it'd be really interesting to see how you use these in game. Uh, but from a list perspective, I would... I think it's a great list. I just think you've got the infantry combination the wrong way around. I think yeah. after hearing what you've said, I I can't disagree with that. If I went all those Kingsguard with just shields and then given all my Numenorean spears to back them up, that would be the best of both worlds. Yeah. yeah. No, that would the, be other, the other advantage of that is it's a, you're going to feel a lot more confident winning a fight if you just send off one elf uh, Kingsguard off with a shield to hold up one or two models because he's going to be able to shield at fight six. He's got a pretty good chance of tying and winning that combat. Uh, whereas if you send off your Numenorean warriors to tie something up and use those elves as the support model to win the fights in the other areas, that Numenorean is going to have less of a chance of surviving. I know they're fight four, still quite good, and they're still strength four. I just feel like their uh, longevity is going to be something that potentially is at risk. I was just going to say, that being said, if they win... They're going to absolutely like Numenorean warriors kill things so quickly, even yeah. dwarves if they're uh, caught out. Unfortunately, all it takes is a couple of, of uh, quick kicks from that strength five captain uh, at defense seven in there as well. Uh, they're pretty damaging. So, strength four, apparent apologies. It's only uh, a Lendl and a Sealed or the strength five. But, yeah, um, uh, like so strength four captains, gonna, yeah, just strength four captains. It's just uh, another thing with that elven front line, if you come up against a terror army, you've got the courage five in the front as well. So I really yeah. do think that's the most optimal way to do it. Um, but hey, I have 12 painted high off spearmen. So we're using them, baby. You're going to use them. Yeah. <laughs> well, Let's jump into our next list. Yep. All right. We've got Nathan, the hunter. He's playing Azog's hunters uh, and he's got Bolg on a Felwag with a bow. Leading four hunter orcs, riding felwags, two felwags, six hunter orcs, three hunter orcs with bows, Fimble the hunter on felwag, and then three wags, six hunter orcs, and then three more hunter orcs with bows. I was taking Gilglad at 500, and he's taken Bolg at 500. Another mm. one fate hero. What do you guys think? But much like the love of my life, Dale, I think Azog Hunters <laughs> is probably one of the best, best armies at 500 points. Uh, you know, if you come off your, if you come off your wags, or he's got a lot on foot, the hunter orcs on foot, two attacks, you're throwing in there. Yes, you're a glass cannon, but you'll you'll kill things and you'll do it well. Those two strength four attacks from a hunter orc are just insane. Yeah. Oh, I and really love fell wags. I think they're very underestimated in the game. I know we make jokes about fell wags all the time, and some of us, particularly in Melbourne, will yell, it's the final fell wag when we get a chance. Um, <laughs> but the, the great thing about them is that ability to not have to have line of sight to charge a target. And in this game, particularly with how we play terrain in Victoria and to a lesser extent, New South Wales, we have a lot of terrain that is actually great for blocking line of sight. And the people who use Felwags really well in Victoria, the people who are able to get them out of line of sight, get them close to the enemy where your opponent can't see them to shoot or charge or take them out of the game, and then having them run around a corner and pin something down or, or tie it up for a turn. Um, particularly with this list, as, as Jacob said, Bolg is quite, uh, is defence one. He, so fight... 
one fate point. It's one. Sorry, yeah. it took me a little while to get it out then. Um, with the Thelwags, at least it gives you an opportunity to tie things up and let Bog fight things on his terms. You can use those wags as a defensive measure to kind of pin stuff down, let Bog deal with a person at a turn. Then one of those unit choices that I think actually can add a lot to an army. So I love the fact he's got a heap of infantry models in there. And I love the fact that he's taken the time to put a few Thelwags in the list without models riding them just to help the army uh, get to get to grips with what it's going to have to face because the hunter orcs are going to have to get to combat they are defense four it's going to be very hard for them to get there straight away at least using those art models to slow down block line of sight in combat so they are quite a large model and it's not really talked about very often but having those 40 millimeter bases to block models moving past or to block line of sight with models that are quite bigger than other models to force in the ways on shooting is actually quite a handy little thing to have in the list. Yeah, mm. I I like this list. Uh, I think it's great to see another army that is not all about... Uh, it, it's going to play different, and I think it's going to be a really interesting to list to see uh, how it goes in the tournament just from the point of view of having a lot of really cool models that will get into combat and have the great damage potential um, but is not relying on a gimmick or a single hero to carry the army list. This is a list where everything in it is actually quite dangerous altogether. As, as amazing as Bolg is, if he dies, the list can still function. So I yeah. got to talk about Fimble the Hunter here. So Fimble is 50 points. He's fight five and then more or less a normal captain profile. He's got three might. So for 50 points and fight five with a normal captain profile, you're looking really good already. On top of that, he has Strike, and then he can take a Felwag, and he has the Huntmaster special rule, which means when he's mounted, he ignores the penalties uh, suffered by cavalry for moving through difficult terrain. So he is super mobile, super high fight, has Strike, and is a complete bargain. For 60 points on a Wag, to me, he seems like one of the most cost-effective models out there. What do you guys think about Fimble? Alongside Derb, is it no Derb? Not Derbers, Birder. Alongside Birder, the troll. I think yeah, definitely one of the most points effective models in the game. Hundred hmm. percent. Yeah. The, the only thing that would make him better was if he had a lance or a two handed <laughs> weapon. Just model yourself onto it. You'll be right. It's true. He no, I don't need that. Bow default. So. Oh no no, and that and that's great. Like he's yeah. uh, as far as evil models go i think you're on the money there he is one of the most cost efficient models that you can get um the fact of the matter is and, and <coughs> particularly how i'd like to play my games i don't like to have my entire army together and what i really like about this list is it's a list that can separate and can work quite functionally as two separate forces yeah you don't um, have to pull your resources yeah. all right let's jump into our next list uh so we've just gone through the hunter and now we have Geordie the Beard. Geordie's a very experienced player. Not sure how many tournament wins he has so far, but he's gotten a couple best painting awards. Uh, and he's playing the Easterlings and the Variags of Khand combination. At 500 points, he's got a Khandish chieftain, not a king, on a chariot with a bow with two Khandish charioteers. Then he's got an Easterling captain with shield. Um, and then his warband's pretty similar. He's got a bunch of warriors with pike, um, about half his warriors are black dragons with pike, which gives them plus one fight and plus one courage. He's got a banner and he's got an Eastland cataphract with a war drum. And then he's got one more war band that's pretty similar. Um, it's an Eastland captain with shield, four warriors with shield and pike and five black dragons with shield and pike. So all his warriors have shield and pike, about half of them are black dragon. He's got a kind of chieftain, two Eastland captains with shields. What are you guys thinking here? This is going to be real weird, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'd almost want to drop a few of those black dragons to just make them regular Eastling warriors and give his front line of his pike flails. I've seen this happen. It was just one model in an army, and it's it's a beautiful sight where a phalanx can suddenly walk into two models with their two spear supports and use their flail. And so if you've got a large front line using flails, yes, you drop yourself down to fight one, but that's fine because you've got your black dragons at the back of the pike block. It's essentially an extra attack 
in that combat, if I'm not mistaken. A model with a flail, whip, or scourge may opt to whirl. A model that whirls reduces their fight value to one after all other modifiers for the duration of the fight. Should a model that whirled win the fight, they do not strike normal. Instead, they make a single strike against every enemy model engaged in the fight. So you're I, plus, a plus one attack to your three attack pike block. That's what I, I do. I really derail. like this list. There's three heroes in this list. The, the Kandish Chariots are essentially providing... Um, I, it, it kind of reminds me of the scene from Deadpool when he's riding the Zamboni down the ice <laughs> rink. Like he's going to clear things in front of him uh, with the chariots. It's almost like they're the line breakers and the Eastlings just run in the back, particularly with the cataphract with warm drum in there going, come on, boys, keep up. We can do this. Um, oh, sorry. It's there's three chariots. I yeah, thought it was three of them. A Kandish chieftain and then like two Kandish mountain boys no it's three no. chariots that's that's incredible yeah yeah <laughs> holy shit so the chariot. great thing is they've all got bows so they're all doing drive-bys while they're at it i mean <laughs> exactly like yeah, i i like this list it has a, a decent amount of numbers particularly at, at 500 points it's got a heap of defense six which sits really well with my normal play style those chariots take up a heap of space um, oh, just because their bases are so <laughs> wide. So it's going to be interesting to see how he, you know, has his phalanx, phalanx somehow support those chariots when their bases are so big. He's going to need to send them around the flank, but they're not that maneuverable with their weird movement rules. So, yeah, I think I, that's the issue in, with all in, chariots. But, yeah, it's it's interesting. In terms of the evil list here, I think it has a lot of damage potential, particularly with those chariots if you use them right. But, again, it's got the numbers. It's defense six. It doesn't break... Uh, until it wants to break, essentially. <laughs> That's the best way of describing its special rule. Um, it's going to be a good list. And it's performed recently at a 750-point tournament recently. Kylie brought a similar but different list. The same idea, Eastlings and Khan with just a handful of chariots and came out with the win. So this list, I think it's proved. Now it's just seeing if this will work at 500 points. I think it's probably one of my picks for favorites, to be honest. Also, in terms of piloting, Going up against Geordie a few a few times, I know that he can see a game like a few turns ahead. And that's something you really got to do with those chariots. Yeah. So I honestly, out of all the lists I've seen, this is this is definitely my favorite. Yeah. Let's jump into our next list. Uh, this is Rain the Shadow. Now, this is a nasty list. He's going with Angmar. He's got the Tainted on Horse as his leader just by himself. Um, he's got Birder, Troll Chieftain, with one Orc Warrior with Shield. And then he's got a Barrow White with six Orcs with Shield and six Orcs with Spear and Shield. And then another one of those same Warbands, a Barrow White, six more Orcs with Shield and six more Orcs with Spear and Shield. So any model within three inches of a Spirit Hero, so those Barrow Whites or the Tainted, uh, will get the Terra Special Rule. This army looks just very powerful at 500 points. Terra Orcs looking- are the bane of my existence. <laughs> I'm just looking at this list at this <clears throat> list going, this is exactly what you do not want to fight with your list, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more, Josh. Any this list or the list with Bolg, this list will just delete. Oh no, I'd, I'd gladly take on the Bolg list. I'm looking at this list going double barrel white and a ring race with yeah. that much damage, that much magic potential just sits there and goes. I'm sorry, Google lad. Were you planning to fall off your horse and sleep for the rest of the game? Yeah. And, and what I mean is this list will shut down that bog list really well as well. Um, I think you'll still be fine with the fight six. That's a really good option in there. It's yeah. a heap of orcs. A- again, they are terror causing, but they are still only strength three. So they, they're, they're still going to be chipping along. Yeah, they're not Moran and orcs at least. But um, it's a large amount of numbers. Again, a lot of terror in there, having the minus one as well from the tainted nearby. The one thing that this army list is going to really struggle with is might points. Uh, and that's just simply because I believe the tainted only has one off from memory. Pretty sure. Yeah, and Birdo has three. So it is going to run out of might very quickly. Um, and those Barrow Whites, at, even at defense eight, so they are defense eight. Defense this seven. Bad. I'm defense seven. I'm having one of those days where my memory of all of my models is like going out the window. Uh, so Look, it's it's work. better than my memory of 
all the models. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, if they can shut down a hero quick and early, you're just going to overwhelm your enemy. The Tainted gives you a compel um, and a tra- oh, just sat will drain courage even. The Tainted just chucking a, a, a three-point drain courage spell a turn on someone like Gilgalad, potentially dropping him down to courage one. Or even doing this to Bolg and just watching Bolg sit there as a courage zero potentially uh, hero, not being able to charge a terror causing orc is absolutely hilarious. And I hope this army does well simply for that fact. Drain courage is my favorite spell in the game. And I want to jump in with the might points. I totally agree with you that this list is low on might. But remember, the Tainted has a special rule, which at the start of the movement phase, if he spends a point of will, then no model within six inches of him can benefit from a with me call from a hero. So it means that if the enemy, or if you have priority and you drop that, the enemy's heroic will be nowhere near as effective as it would be. So it's a really good way of conserving might points in a low might army. The other thing as well is, does that affect stand fast? You probably, it you probably does. Both... That's, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So that's also another huge thing, particularly if you look at a lot of the armies that we've seen so far have been around that courage three mark, elves being the exception to the rule. Um, having something that can take away your stand fast off your big bad hero uh, is actually quite good. And from what we've seen in the list already, there's a couple of heroes of legends that we've seen amongst them, Gilgalad, Bolg, uh, Something like this is going to be the big difference from an army breaking and sticking around or not. So, yeah, couldn't agree more. So, the Tainted's a pretty decent hand grenade. Throw them in there, roll, roll a few sixes to do some wounds. That's true. Man. Yeah, at the start of the combat phase, every model in base contact with him rolls a dice on a six, they just take a wound. You know what I think is also really awesome is this list that we've got here from uh, L with the King Under the Mountain. All right, uh, read so it out for us. 500 point list. Here we go. Khazad Doom. Uh, we've got Durin, King of Khazad Doom with 15 Hearthguard. Oh, that is that that's painful. Just to read that aloud is painful. Yeah. Uh, one dwarf warrior with a banner and shield. And then we've got a dwarf captain with shield and five dwarf rangers with long bows. So beautiful list. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pretty much. Like, um, <laughs> Josh, just explain what a Hearthguard is. Uh, strength four, defense seven, bodyguard. Burly. Uh, burly, two-handed weapon. <laughs> yep. Uh, a Kazad guard with a two-point upgrade from Durin. Uh, they are savage. Yeah. 15. Like, what, are they D8? No, D7. They you. are D7. Still, yeah. it's D7. Like, oh. Yeah, um, it, it's just the high defense. It's the bodyguard. Um, the movement five is literally the only bad thing about that miniature. Yeah. <laughs> um, the they are a they hit like a absolute sledgehammer. Um, the key to beating this army is going to be a hundred percent positioning, a hundred percent using models that are. Uh, a, a higher fight or have a high strength. That is going to be the key to beating this list. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is one of the few lists I think honestly looks at that Urukai assault blister and goes, "Do your best. Try it. Come yeah. on. <laughs> fuck around <laughs> and try, fuck around and find out. Yeah. Exactly. Um, my only critique there is the dwarf captain with a shield. I. I think in this list, as nice as the dwarf rangers with longbows are, I would have gone throwing weapons. I would have gone a dwarf captain, uh, sorry, with the throwing weapon instead of the shield and a whole bunch of dwarf rangers with throwing weapons. It gives you that <coughs> small little outflanking force that could have been used to harass the flanks of the enemy, force them to, to group up and go head toe to toe with what will be essentially the anvil of the, the, the hearth guard at the front there. Yeah, I mean, this is 100%. The what that is the hammer and the anvil in one. The half guard are just so powerful. Yeah. Look, Geordie, mate, I like your uh, I like your Eastling list, but oh, I don't know, man. I think this is the this might be the winner. So I the like counterpoint it. to this list is you got no spears. So you, you have the banner, but no spears means that you pretty much always want attack. Um, so against a lot of a lot of the armies have those spears back them up. So we'll just have more dice. Um, to hopefully win more fights. 
but he's got the numbers. And when you don't have the spears, you can, you're not scared of spreading out into a longer line and coming around to take away your Mm -hmm. opponent's spears. And yeah, he's got, what's that, 23, 24 models? I'm just going to point out the case in point here. You've got, let's have a look at the analysts that we've seen so far. We've seen Hunter Rock Warriors with the same fight. So if they tie a fight, they're rolling off. Hunter Rocks have two attacks needing sixes to wound these guys. The hearth guard are turning around to those poor Hunter Rocks going, I'm sorry, I'm wounding you on threes. Yeah, and the hearth guard are fight four while Hunter Rocks are fight three. So they've got really good statistical odds of killing yeah. versus being killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you compare that to, say, the your Kingsguard, defense six, fight five. Yes, he will win ties. However, if they win the fight, they are wounding you on fours. Yeah. yeah. You're wounding them on sixes. And they also have the option to piercing strike, which can bring them up to strength five as well, where it matters. So these guys are just pure damage output while being pure tanks then power it's... and and, and I, you've just hit i think the, the crux of it these are a great army of line breakers the hammer and the anvil as we've said the problem is that it can't, it's going to come to certain scenarios and i question whether or not this list can keep up with it that's a uh, really good point do we just say bugger like, it and drop the the rangers and the dwarf captain and bringing a, a Kazadum dwarf ballista just to give him an almighty middle finger. No, I don't even think that. I think he needs the dwarf rangers in there just simply for the fact that they bring something that can move through difficult terrain a little bit quicker. What what I was going to say is this army is going to really struggle to hold objectives simply because they are a small elite heavy army. They are not going to do so well at missions where they have to get across the table or run to the centre. Um, you're also going to run the issue of running out of might very quickly, just relying on the two heroes compared to, say, the Eastlings from Geordie with six might. Yeah. Um, the army is going to be very strung out and it will come down to being an experienced player and knowing how to use this list effectively to take the full advantage of it, I think. And Al definitely has the experience. He recently came second place at a, a tournament a few months back using a 750-point version of this list, effectively. Was that just, like, 30 half-guard or something? It was. I think it was still 15 <laughs> half-guard. He just added in two Dwarf Kings and some more Dwarf Warriors. Yeah, so fair, fair, fair. <laughs> it's a, a very... I kind of wish I'd made that tournament. I kind of wish I hadn't been umpiring. Now I might have uh, had a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. there we go. <laughs> take off the take off the yellow jersey and get more into Middle Earth. Oh, wait till I bring, start bringing my whistle to and the uh, the, the wristbands to oh, wipe no. off the sweat after the games. <laughs> Foul <laughs> on the ball. All we right. don't need Josh at any. Deliver it. <laughs> Let's take this into our next army list, which is uh, a player who really needs no introduction. Um, mm. It's Jeremy. We're gonna give him one anyway. Jeremy the Green Dragon. For those of you who don't know, the Green Dragon podcast is the longest running and by far the most popular Middle Earth podcast where they talk tactics. And um, Jeremy has to be one of the most experienced Middle Earth players that exists. He's been playing it since it was released 20 years ago. Um, So almost as long as I have been alive, Jeremy has been playing Middle Earth. Um, And... He's got a 500-point Dunland Legendary Legion. Sean, do you want to give this one a read? Yeah. So, Dunland Legendary Legion, Fried and Wolfsbane on horse, four Dunland Horsemen and two two Crabane. He's got the Oathmaker with 11 Wildmen of Dunland, Gorulf Ironskin, five Dunlanding Haskals, four Dunlanding Warriors with bow, one with a banner, and two with shield. All right, let's quickly talk about the Dunland Legendary Legion special rules. Now, this means that your banners are a six-inch range, and once per game, Thryden gets a war cry ability that gives all models within 12 inches of him plus one to wound. I wow. think in terms of all of the lists that we've read so far, this one has the most potential to cause your opponent to lose focus of their own army and start panicking about something that they don't understand or, or and that's just simply because this is an army list that you don't see very often mm. that's very true 
but also like, they're going up that, against Jeremy. That yeah. the psychological factor of that alone is terrifying. Yeah. So a bit of backstory there, because I probably know Jeremy a little bit longer and more intently than you guys do. Oh, I I I would never play poker with him because his poker face is arguably the best of anybody I've ever met. I've met professional poker players. Um, he's been playing this game from the original Middle Earth magazine scenarios when they first came out. He he knows every little bit about positioning miniatures down to the millimeter when it comes to the game. Um, he is one of the nicest blokes as well, and it is impossible to get angry at him because he is just a generally nice bloke. So even when you're losing and you're like, I'm having the worst fucking game, but he's a really nice guy. Yeah. That that's what it's like to play Jeremy. And unfortunately, this is a list that he will do very well with because the, his opponents are going to be sitting there going, I've got to remember this war cry special rule. I've got to remember what Crebane do. I've got to remember that this defense five iron skin guy all of a sudden has heroic defense and now need I need natural sixes to wound him. There is a lot of things in this army list that Jeremy will know and opponents I think will really struggle to think about what everything does and overthink how how to play against it I think that's the best way of just uh, uh, of saying it that it has a lot of numbers it's got a lot of movement it's got ranged it's got cavalry it brings a it covers all of its bases and it's very much the kind of list that well, I, literally the last tournament I went to, I took Rangers of the Affiliate. I, I took almost a mirror match for what Jeremy has in his own Rangers of the Affiliate list. So I, I kind of really appreciate these lists where you take a little bit of everything just to try and make your opponent go, how do I deal with each part of this and forget to like focus on their own game plan. Yeah. And talking of just like... The, the main models that come to mind with that are the Kreebane. They're 20 points. They can fly. They've got four wounds. Mm. When these got released, a lot of people didn't understand them, but they are incredible. They can tar pit. They can take objectives. They can only be hit by archers on the roll of six. Sixes, so they can be yeah. screens. They are just so effective at running scenarios, jumping over lines and harassing. They can do everything. Um, and with four wounds, they you can risk them and it doesn't matter because they'll come out on top. And and Gorulf is great at just throwing him in to say you're Gilgalad or whatever and just going, cool, heroic defense. Yeah. You'll, you'll win, but will you wound me? Yeah, Maybe. he gets a free heroic defense if he's in combat with the hero, which is just incredible. Yeah. Um, another thing I want to point out in this list is um, is the Huskals. A lot of people complain about Huskals being too weak for their points. Um, but I think that they're one of the better written profiles in the game because everyone <coughs> always takes them, but no one ever spams them because they're definitely a few more points than you would pay for in other lists, but they're still so important to include just really well balanced in terms of their points versus their, um, how effective they are. I really like that profile. Yeah. And again, he's got the oath maker in there. He's got a heap of wild and he has yeah. a lot of numbers in this list. Like you look at it there and it goes, okay, three decent size war bands, but then when you actually start to put it all together and go, he's got nearly 30 models, if not 30. Mm. Um, <laughs> you actually sit there going, that is a lot to kill at 500 points. Like that is, that is me saying uh, if I was L with his hearth guard that we just talked up before, guaranteeing that every single one of those hearth guard kills two models in a game. Mm. I mean, it, it's possible, but this is it's a list a that's ask. going to be able to play scenarios better. As you've just said, with the, the birds, they can tar pit really well. You can hold up two, two, uh, two hearth guard for two turns with a single Kazid and basically shut them out of the game for a long period of time, time just by charging them. And they, they've still got a decent chance of winning and doing their own damage back in return. Um, yeah. totally it is right. going to come down to how this army does well in scenarios where it does need to split up. And what I mean by that is the, the missions where you've got to capture objectives, where you've got to seize prizes, you've got to run to the middle. I think as an overall force, uh, it works really well. There's lots of little armies that run around the battlefield. But if you target particularly on one section of this army, I think it's going to be a little more brittle. Uh, but in terms of what it brings to the table, it's got a bit of everything and it's probably the most intimidating for a lot of players to play. Yeah, and I want to point something out with the Dunlending Warriors, especially in 
when you use that war cry for the plus one to wound, um, you can piercing strike with them. They're only defense five base, but they're really cheap. So if you piercing strike and they die, you don't really care, which is really different to a hearth guard. If you piercing strike with a hearth guard and then they die, you're losing a 13 point model. But if you piercing strike with a Dunlending warrior, it gives you plus one to wound on top of your plus one to wound war cry. And then they die. Well, it's always worth worth the risk. Whereas with some other models, it's not. But Dunlending Warriors is just that cheap point where it is worth it, and they still a super high damage output. Yeah. And don't right. forget that banner rule as well. Just having that banner, particularly at six inches, with the special rule for the army, that's going to be really tough to beat as well. Yeah. Well, that is our eighth list. Um, which list overall do you guys think is the best one or your favorite to win this tournament? I think Sean just volunteered to go first. <laughs> yeah, sweet, sick. It's, it's genuinely a tough one. I, until Josh spoke about Jeremy's list, I was like, yeah, no, it's, I like it. It's a fun list. It's going to do well, but uh, yeah, it's definitely now thrown a spanner in the works of the lists that I, I'm i looking at. So, obviously, this one, the Dunlin list. Then you've got Al's um, Kazadoom with his half guard and um, Geordie's, Geordie's Eastling Khan. But I, I think Geordie's Eastling Khan is the one that trumps more for me. Just that that killing power of those those chariots. And, and they can stay alive because you need, what, fives and sixes to get past the barrier because they're mm. on their chariots and then just having the staying power of the Eastlings coming through behind mopping up what's left um yeah and knowing Geordie is a player yeah that's the one I'm I'm looking at yeah all right Josh which one are you picking I'm gonna go a little bit left of center I'm actually gonna go with Reigns the Shadow List uh the Angmar oh, yeah. I really love the combination of Terra in the uh amongst the orcs with all of those um, spectre miniatures. I think having the combination of two barrel whites and a ring wraith at 500 points is going to be really devastating for some people who are unprepared, unprepared to protect their heroes uh, from magic. Uh, having the ability to paralyze um, heroes, birder in there as well at fight six to run in there and go, oh, hi, little Kazard guard, bye, little Kazard guard, uh, or even to be able to run into just a group of things. It's the only list in there to me that kind of has a lot of threat potential whilst not being expensive. And I think it maximizes the return on the points investment the most out of the list in there. Um, so I, I think that list will do very well. I'd be surprised. Um, uh, it needs obviously someone using it really well and taking full advantage of those uh, spirit rules amongst those Angmar Orcs, but I think it'd do really well. Yeah, and that leaves just my choice. I think I have to pick the Green Dragon, Jeremy. Uh, he's definitely the most experienced player, and that Dunlending list just has so much that it can do. He's got four Cav, he's got the Creebane, he's got some Spears, he's got a horde of cheap troops with the Fearless from the Oathmaker. I think it's going to be really, really hard to stop, especially in Jeremy's hands. <coughs> All right, well, that's the video. Thank you for watching and stay tuned because the first episode will be coming out a week from when this one was released. It's going to be Rivendell versus Isengard. Catch you next time.